Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a beautiful Monday morning here from lemoniradio.com in the heart of Nicosia, Cyprus. You are listening to Meeting Points, the second round of Meeting Points in collaboration with International UN Watch. I'm your host, Oresis Tringiris. We are very happy to inaugurate our second round of interviews. And the first uh, subject for this round will be about hate speech. Hate speech is a subject that has been uh, around the news lately. We have been having the recent controversies uh, what is the power of social media on hate speech, of social media companies specifically. And we're going to talk uh, on our first uh, round of interviews with our guest about uh, the phenomenon of hate speech, uh, both internationally and regionally, because I'm sure there are connotations among countries. And as a case study, we're going to see uh, the case study of Cyprus, what forms of hate discourse uh, we find in Cyprus. And together with us, uh, we're going to have uh, Julie Dilmach, from Paris Descartes University, Paris Descartes University, and also we're going to have Mr. Osgil uh, Kojadal from Cyprus International University, and together we're going to discuss uh, about hate speech. I hope you're going to find this first discussion very interesting. Uh, we're going to refer also to a report written about uh, Cyprus and hate speech uh, entitled uh, Public Discourses of Hate Speech in Cyprus, Awareness, Policies, and Prevention. We're going to head to a to a song until we get uh, our connections ready with our guests and uh, enjoy the song and we'll be right soon with you stay tuned thank you very much welcome back ladies and gentlemen of this beautiful monday morning we hope you enjoyed your tune and uh, guess what we have our guests we have our guests online dr osger kojada and dr julia alev dilmach and uh, uh, our subject for today, for those you who have just uh, tuned in, is about uh, hate speech, uh, hate speech, man- hate speech manifestations uh, uh, in general. Uh, how the, how does hate speech work, or how destructive is hate speech, and uh, what is hate speech? And also specifically, we're going to talk about the, the case study of Cyprus, and I'm sure our guests will have uh, from their own experiences, from their context and academic interest, they can uh, they can add to this to that. And uh, we're going to be referencing a, a report which is out and you can find it from the uh, Friedrich Heber Stiftung website of Cyprus, uh, the, the Cyprus chapter, which is a public discourses of hate speech in Cyprus, awareness, policies and prevention. It has been authored by our guest, Julia Alev Dilmach and Osger Kojadal and moi, Horace Stringilis. Without any further ado, I would first uh, like to thank you and welcome you, Osger and Julie, for being here with us on this uh, on this morning uh, for the viewers and listeners who are uh, listening to this podcast and this video in posterior. Uh, let's start from maybe, why don't you introduce uh, yourself? So, and we'll start with Julie because your name specifically is first on the report. Can you please introduce yourselves to our <laughs> listeners? Okay, thank you very much, Orestes. So I'm Julia Alev Dilmach. Uh, I'm an associate professor of sociology. Uh, and I'm also a member of the Center of Philosophy, Epistemology and uh, Politics, Philippol in uh, Paris Descartes University. Um, so in fact, my academic interests include deviants related to the digital uh, era, including cyber humiliation and cyber harassment on social media, but also the impact of surveillance technology on society. Ooh, surveillance is another hot topic. Yeah. Because uh, we have been talking in the introduction, where does hate speech stop and where does uh, uh, freedom of speech begins and uh, what is uh, freedom in general? And uh, we have been we have been viewing in abuses of uh, in order to curb hate speech, but maybe that's another story. In order to curb hate speech, maybe you're cutting down other freedoms. But uh, let's go to thank you for your introduction, Julie, and let's go to Osgir because we have a lot. Indeed, we have a lot to talk about. Osgir, can you please? Introduce yourselves uh, loud and clear to our audiences, please. Yes, sure. Hello to everyone. Uh, I'm one of the co-authors of the aforementioned report. Uh, I'm actually a, a, an assistant professor of international relations. Uh, I normally study uh, conflict resolution. And this report was a challenge for me and it helped me see how actually we can uh, make use of our analysis of hate speech towards uh, peace building because these topics usually are not studied together. However, I see a, a lot of overlap and as we shall probably discuss later, there is uh, quite a lot that should be done inside this in terms of preventing hate speech, in terms of detecting it, and in terms of 
also taking measures to help those who suffer as you know the recipients of hate speech. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that will do as an introduction on my part, I hope. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Osgir, for introducing yourself. You gave us a, uh, you, both of you gave us a very, a very nice first uh, touch of, uh, of uh, you said about hate speech, hate speech and peace building. And also you said about what is the effects of, uh, of the recipients. And also because we're in Cyprus, uh, hate speech has a, has a historical perspective, unfortunately, since the last 50 more years or so uh, because of the special situation. But uh, let's, start, uh, let's start from the beginning. Uh, what uh, to to sensitize a bit of uh, our audiences uh, the first question would be what is hate speech i mean we already mentioned jury that hate speech is not committed just through words and language and there are different forms of of hate speech but uh, do you Julie, do you want to tackle and give us what is hate speech in a nutshell before we move to the next questions please what is the, what is hate speech so first of all uh, i think we should say that hate speech is not a new social issue uh, this is a, this, this type of negative narrative has already existed and it has become more prevalent in society due to social uh, media. So in fact, the, the problem of hate speech is exacerbated when such discourses are shared and amplified on the internet uh, because it gives to the hateful rhetoric and added resonance. So as you know, in the, with the social media, we can communicate with each other, uh, but uh, it's also um, can be considered as a platform used by individuals to spread hate, to promote uh, negative stereotypes, and this in the name of free speech. So it is very difficult, in fact, to define where free speech ends and where hate speech begins. Um, so, however, of course, if, even if uh, it's very difficult to define uh, the, the concept of hate speech, even if there is no consensual and definitive definition, uh, we can say that hate speech is any kind of communication in speech, writing or behavior, as you said, uh, that attacks or uses discriminatory language uh, with reference to a person or a group on the basis of who they are. So namely, it can be based on the religion, the ethnicity, uh, the nationality, the color, gender. So uh, hate speech are not only discourses, they, they have uh, a negative impact uh, on society and they disrupt the social harmony. Uh, so why hate speech is a problem then why uh, they are they constitute uh, a social issue first of all it's because uh, they are a threat to human rights uh, because they create uh, categories in the society they co categorize individuals they divide individuals they exacerbating differences most of the time uh, based on wrong assumption and stereotypes uh, and they cause also for the victim a feeling of insecurity for people in people targeted uh, as hate speech constitute also a direct uh, incitement to violence. So this is the definition, you know, uh, we can agree on. Mm -hmm. uh, you said before it's difficult to define where hate speech begins and where free speech uh, starts and, and vice versa. And indeed in in various countries and various jurisdictions, maybe there are different interpretations and different applications in regards to the law and practices. Osger, would you like to add something on what is hate speech and what are the dimensions of it to what Julie said? Uh, I mean, uh, I, I will, uh, of course, as a co-author, uh, definitely uh, um, concur with Julie, uh, that that's exactly how she described uh, what qualifies as hate speech in terms of the conceptual meaning. And as we point out in our report, uh, mm -hmm. actually internationally, it, it's, an, it's not really possible to define it or even domestically. There are lots of uh, efforts, but they haven't managed to come up with a single definition. 
uh, within the European Union context, for instance, uh, they have done a lot of work, but there's no single definition either. More work is actually gearing towards online hate speech and how it can be prevented and whether we can have certain mechanisms, uh, certain means available to people to report it. And we are sort of making progress in detecting hate speech in Europe, for instance, but we are yet to find a way to tackle it completely. Because mm. the sanctions are not there. Uh, of course, uh, as we describe in the report, we are not calling for any uh, criminal charges, but we are speaking of how uh, people can be um, con can be convinced to basically take hate speech more seriously, because it definitely sometimes has certain uh, gray zones. Whether you can consider hate speech as uh, liberty, as freedom of speech, versus whether it is really uh, hurting human psyche, whether it's basically uh, bringing about any potential or actual conflict playing the role of a trigger. Those are different aspects of it. It's a very, very complex and unfortunately uh, hard to resolve a problem because as human civilization and particularly as a European uh, community, we are so much attached to our democratic rights and everyone speaking up their mind. And most people, unfortunately, still see hate speech within that context. But our goal, uh, as it was in the report and as we discussed today, is to highlight that actually in this new environment, as Julie was mentioning early on, digital, in this digital uh, milieu, uh, it, our challenges are even bigger because there's no editing in online uh, kind of work. There are lots of websites and particularly social media, which we examined in the report. Mm. A lot of hate speech uh, goes unnoticed and people keep suffering. I mean, those who are being the, uh, receiving end of it. And we, we as a society tend to ignore it. And we try to develop a certain uh, proposals, which we hope the authorities, authorities will take seriously, as we actually spent the last uh, section of the report uh, outlining how police, judiciary, and media regulatory bodies should actually look at hate speech more seriously, report it, sanction it if possible. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's time for our first break. So, so far to cap the first part of our show, we have been talking about in general, what is hate speech? Uh, we talk about hate speech on social media and at the gray zones, for example, metaphors and because words does hurt and the mentalities. We're going to continue after this song and make sure you find the, uh, the report written by Julie Alev Dilmaj and Osger Kochata, our two guests and moi, I have contributed as well, uh, from the Friedrich Herbert Stiftung website in Cyprus with titled Public Discourses of Hate Speech in Cyprus, Awareness, Policies, and Prevention. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Meeting Points. It's yet another show. I'm your host, Reset Tringiris, and together with us, we're, we're talking about uh, hate speech, specifically in Cyprus, but also how the phenomenon is being transformed in the interwebs of, <laughs> of the internet. Together with us is Osgir Kojadal and Julie Alev Dilmach. We have talked in the first past part about uh, what is hate speech, in, hate speech in general. And now let's move to the hate question. Uh, guys, I mean, uh, gentlemen, ladies, sorry. Uh, Hate speech, we can talk about how hate speech is, is, is uh, occurs in social media. And yet, this is very violent because social media, can, something can spread like wildfire. Uh, uh, so the report, does a report that the mention report uh, only covers hate speech on social media? And uh, specifically, let's let's take a, let's take Cyprus as a, as a context. Where where else do we find the hate speech incidents beyond social media? Uh, Juliet, would you like to tackle this question? Start. Uh, yes. So, of course, we we have analyzed social media uh, users' comments uh, in in the report, uh, but also, you know, we analyze uh, cartoons published in newspapers, and uh, we tried also to find, you know, uh, some hate speech in political discourses. In fact, we, we didn't search for it. We found, uh, let's say, some uh, hate speech in political. Uh, 
uh, discourses. Um, so beyond yes, the, uh, I've so, seen some yes. very disturbing cartoons. <laughs> now that you mentioned cartoons, I've seen some very disturbing cartoons. Uh, people with knives in their mouths uh, coming on shore and stuff like that. <laughs> so how, how about the politicians? I mean, uh, if we talk about the areas controlled by the Republic of Cyprus here, uh, many times we find uh, politicians that they they usually often use uh, hate speech in their everyday talk uh, for whatever reason, and uh, there is just impunity or something. How would you comment on that, uh, Julie or Özger? Let's say that uh, the political actors occasionally uh, make use of gender stereotypes in quarrels uh, with their peers. Uh, that's what we, uh, we, we saw, let's say, we observe uh, in the report. Uh, we saw also that sometimes journalists uh, participate uh, also in a way to the spread of hate speech. Uh, so that's why we, uh, mentioned the fact that it's important to raise awareness about the issue in all spheres of the society and not only uh, at the micro level, uh, but also to implement and strengthen the existing regulations to prevent uh, hate speech. Hmm. That will be actually my next question. I mean, we have this report here of 69, about 70 pages, and uh, I'm repeating for our guests, uh, for our listeners, sorry, Public Discourses of Hate Speech in Cyprus, Awareness, Policy, and Prevention. Uh, you can find it online from the Friedrich Hepper Stiftung uh, uh, website, link in the description. And uh, so what are the objectives of this report? I mean, uh, uh, to whom can be useful and uh, uh, how can, uh, for example, I'm a journalist, uh, how can uh, it can be useful for journalists or policymakers? What are the objectives? Whoever wants to answer, just take the mic and do. I mean... Mm -hmm. I, I think I can uh, try to answer that question. Uh, obviously, we are targeting uh, policymakers as well as the general public because we need to raise awareness for hate speech. But what we came across, uh, as we discussed in the report in the Turkish Cypriot community, for instance, was whenever they try to highlight hate speech uh, in public uh, campaigns, uh, they were uh, then became, you know, targets of hate speech, interestingly. Even those who are advocating elimination or tackling of hate speech being targeted by hate speech. Mm. So that shows us, highlights how serious, how uh, important this topic is. And we definitely uh, have two targets, policymakers, uh, you know, legislators, uh, government uh, bodies, as well as the general public because both of them are in dire need of uh, recognizing the importance of this topic and doing something about it. We are not claiming that there's no work done, but we are saying that it, it is not enough, actually. More needs to be done hmm. in Cyprus to tackle hate speech. You said about Cyprus, hate speech in Cyprus. Uh, the reality here in Cyprus is that there has been a a physical division of uh, people and societies for so long. So, uh, so obviously, it's one thing, one point is that it's interesting from a person who is living in the southern side of the island to see what was going on in the north because of the of, because of the, uh, the the difference in languages. Uh, people can understand and kind of follow the, the the narrative because it's another language, and also vice versa. So that's also useful to see how the patterns work and maybe there are some similarities, but is the report based on a comparative analysis of the Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot communities in regards to hate speech? Or uh, is it a comparison or is it a contrast? What is it? It, it is a, a comparison. Uh, as we uh, designed a tripartite model to examine both societies in terms of how they basically uh, have hate speech, uh, unfortunately, towards each other. Uh, that's the intercommunal nexus, Greek Cypriots vis-a-vis -vis Turkish Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots vis-a-vis -vis Greek Cypriots. This is definitely embedded in the political culture and definitely one of the main reasons of why Cyprus conflict uh, keeps uh, running forever, unfortunately. The second uh, uh, aspect of our model uh, was basically uh, looking at 
how these two communities are approaching towards the other. Uh, that, that being international students, uh, that being migrants and other minorities in their uh, community. Interestingly, in Turkish Cypriot community, we realize that there is hate speech towards mainland Turks, for instance, as they uh, immigrated uh -huh. into the north or living there. We didn't re really find much uh, evidence of that happening in the south vis-a-vis -vis Greek mainland uh, people. Coming Indeed, it's not happening. Indeed. Uh, we're going to talk about this, uh, these two things, about the, the interesting uh, characteristics of the northern part of Interkin. And uh, also, maybe we don't have the Church of Cyprus in another part of the island, but we do have it here. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are joining after the song break. Enjoy the song. So we give you some time to observe this very, very interesting uh, subject of hate speech and uh, internationally, but also in Cyprus. Uh, be, make sure you catch the report, uh, download it from Friedrich Ever Stifting website here in Cyprus. Public discourses of hate speech in Cyprus, awareness, policies, and prevention. I'm here with, we are here with Julie Dilmaj and Osger Kojadal and moi. And uh, will joining us after the break to delve deeper into these very interesting uh, cases. So see you after the break, the song break, enjoy. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, here on the beautiful Monday morning. Uh, I'm Orestes Tungidis, your host for Meeting Points. These are very first, uh, for those who just tune in, these are very first uh, round of interviews. Uh, the first interview for this second round of Meeting Points. And I'm here with us uh, is Julia Lev Dilmach and Osger Kojadal and moi. And they were talking about HP in Cyprus. Uh, uh, friends, uh, before, uh, before, before, before the break, we talk about the, uh, one peculiar uh, instance uh, of hate speech happening in another part of the island, in the, of the island, which is about uh, uh, Turkish Cypriots uh, talking bad about people coming from uh, Turkey. Maybe listeners uh, who are not uh, akin, they're not, they're not aware of this situation. Can you please give us a context? Uh, Osger and or Julie, your microphone is yours. Let's start with the first the interkin hate speech. Yeah, uh, basically uh, this aspect uh, is essentially due to, uh, how would I say, uh, interesting or uh, sui generis relationship between Turkish Cypriots and Turkey. As uh, Turkish Cypriot community heavily relies on Turkey for financial assistance and political support, we see more and more incidents of hate speech perpetrated against uh, mainland Turks uh, living in North Cyprus, particularly on social media, because in the Turkish Cypriot community, the main political issue is survival, basically. Uh, they are aware of their financial difficulties, their political limbo uh, as the Cyprus conflict still uh, rages on. And hence, as they heavily rely on Turkey and they come under influence of Turkey more and more, then they develop this reaction. So this has something to do with social psychology, I would say. That's the background of it. But still, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting dynamic because we see people uh, who protest against, uh, uh, you know, uh, criticism of such hate speech, for instance. Mm -hmm. There are some incidents like uh, on uh, Turkish Cypriot TV and radio, which we reported in the report, uh, that uh, they use some belittling language against uh, Turkish uh, politicians and public in general, and they get fined for that by the TV supervisory board. But then uh, we, we find also statements by certain unions and certain media bodies who are going against this saying that this is part of our political uh, free speech. Why are you criticizing or fining us for that? Uh, and that's very, very interesting. That tells us that hate speech is actually a very, very political issue. It's difficult to define, and it's difficult to agree on what to do about it. And other interesting things, as we mentioned earlier on, were certain car uh, cartoonist, uh, Utku Karsu, actually, he, he's a regular contributor to uh, Kıbrıs newspaper, uh, literally meaning Cyprus newspaper, a Turkish Cypriot uh, mainstream newspaper. He has a series of cartoons actually describing Turks with pointed mustache, uh, actually at least in one of them, 
with uh, holding some knives and swords, and he got some uh, negative uh, reaction to that. But still, he, he defended his uh, cartoons, and he had similar kind of work also, uh, how shall I put it, incriminating African students as he shows them leaving babies behind and being uh, economic migrants, not students, and so forth. And hmm. interesting thing about that is this happens in every society. This is not something spectacular, something unheard of or unique to Turkish Cypriot community. But the way the media portrays it, we consider that uh, basically uh, uh, hate speech because it definitely targets certain groups of people and targets them very negatively. And hmm. the other thing uh, I think we should also uh, start discussing a little bit is uh, the gender aspect of this. That was our third dimension. Hmm. Julie, and would you like to, to say something about yeah. the gender aspect? Maybe I'll come past to you. Um, yes, in fact, um, we observe that, as you know, the, the two communities both belong to uh, to a Mediterranean culture in which uh, patriarchal norms still prevail. So these norms, uh, these, these gender norms are very important. So as such, uh, traditional views about gender roles are predominant, as well as sanctioning of individuals who do not conform to gender norms. So then uh, we presume that uh, there is also a gender, an intergender uh, nexus of hate speech on the island, especially perpetrated against those who refuse to perform traditional uh, gender roles. So here uh, we focus or we try to analyze uh, the problems faced by women uh, and also LGTB, uh, LGTB I people, Q namely, plus. <laughs> no, Q plus, yes, sorry, uh, namely sexism and homophobia. Uh, so we saw, we could also see that uh, people who refused to perform to this uh, traditional gender roles uh, were a victim of hate speech, uh, <laughs> especially in incidents. Yeah. It's very interesting what you both are saying. I mean, uh, Obviously, the the communi communique of the European Union it's it's, a, it's currently suspended in the north because of this political situation. Uh, but also, even if you take the case of the Church of, of the Church of Cyprus in the Greek Cypriot community, although the the Republic of Cyprus laws are pretty adjusted with the, what the, the directives coming from the European Union, uh, still there is impunity on uh, on on figures like uh, the Archbishop of, of prominent. Uh, cases of, 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 of from the Church of Cyprus. And uh, even if there are uh, complaints, legal complaints against them, uh, the law, we see that it is not applied. I mean, uh, it's just being shut down by the Attorney General. You know, we're, go we're not going to going through in the sake of public interest. We're not going to go through with uh, uh, prosecuting the attribution or whatever on his comments. So uh, I'm wondering, uh, what are the uh, what are the main uh, the main shortcomings of the, the framework that, and the regulations and implementation in the northern part of the island in comes to in, in terms to hate speech. Uh, I think I can speak to that effect. I mean, basically, uh, sure. uh, there are some voluntary organizations in the north, uh, such as the Media Ethics Board, uh, which is actually issuing uh, press releases and warnings to media outlets who are committing hate speech, but the, that does not carry any sanctions. And there is a board uh, which they call a TV supervision board, uh, T Actually, uh, high, actually, it's exactly called uh, Supreme uh, Supervisory Board of Broadcast. And that also is, uh, does something to similar effect. Uh, but that one carries more uh, uh, heavy weight. It, it has a legal standing. But the thing is, they are not good at detecting hate speech. You have to report it in the first place. Mm. They have be a group of people, an association or an individual writing to them. And I think that does not happen very frequently. Actually, I look at that uh, as we studied these numbers of cases, they are relatively very few. There is definitely under-reporting of hate speech. 
And uh, also, uh, it, it's very vaguely defined. I mean, when you look at the uh, journalism code of conduct, uh, which is uh, basically upheld in the North by the uh, Journalist Association, uh, actually, there are two of them, but one of them is very keen on actually upholding these principles. Uh, they are very vague about hate speech. They basically say there shouldn't be any negative terms used for any race or uh, minority and so forth. But they don't go into explaining uh, how one can recognize hate speech. Because, mm. you know, saying that uh, don't use negative terms for groups of people is one thing, but exemplifying that, developing a criteria, making sure that those who are writing news pieces, analysis, know about it is something else. Documents or press releases can stay there in virtual uh, milieu or in print, but if people don't take them seriously, if they don't get educated about it, there is no way you can tackle this problem. Ah, education. So I said a lot that, you know, uh, there has to be some educational campaigns. And that goes for police, that goes for judiciary, that goes for press workers, hmm. members of the media in general, and the wider public. Let's talk about this after a final break. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you, you are listening to Meeting Points. Stay with us for the very fast, very brief part of uh, you're listening to us uh, every every Monday. And uh, Amor Sistringi is our host, and together is Oscar uh, Kojata and Julia Lev Dilmach. And we're going to join us for the very first, very last part of this uh, interview on what needs to be done. Join us after this music break. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, your host, Reza Stringis, and you're listening to Meeting Points, and we're tackling hate speech. We gave a very nice uh, brief about the, the report that is out there. It's a, the, on public discourses and hate speech, uh, specifically for the case in Cyprus, but it's very useful in terms from, for, to transfer to other countries about the awareness and policy and prevention that needs to be done. And uh, because we have only a few minutes, uh, Julie, uh, give us a, give us a one in a nutshell, what does it mean to to awareness? I mean, are ordinary Cypriots aware of the problem? Uh, do they consider hate speech a, a problem that affects them? And uh, if you give us a, an outline as well, what do you think, in your opinion, should be the, the most priority things that need to be done to tackle it? Julie. Okay. Uh, it's a good question, the question of awareness, because... Uh, um, it is not, in fact, it's not uncommon to hear from Cyprus that there is no such thing in Cyprus when speaking of hate speech. Uh, so as if, you know, it was a problem from another society or not related, you know, uh, that something that we cannot find in Cyprus. But in fact, there is a clear sign of the level of widespread unawareness about the concept. So in our analysis, for example, of social media comments, uh, we notice, for example, that some users of the Turkish Cypriot community uh, were using the term Arabs uh, to designate the African population and sometimes even uh, the Afro uh, Cypriots. So even though the individual uh, might not have intention uh, to openly discriminate against uh, minorities, this attitude is discriminative and it leads uh, to hate speech uh, as various population uh, who have nothing in common, they are put in the same basket. So their uh, identity and cultural, but also uh, their personal characteristics are ignored. So here we can see that language is very important, uh, you know, in hate speech, in fact. Uh, so it can convey, you know, such uh, negative messages. So ordinary uh, Cypriots, they seem uh, have only a slight awareness of the problem. Uh, but fortunately, in both uh, communities, there are institutions, uh, of official bodies, but also NGOs that makes a lot of effort to raise uh, awareness and to tackle public hate speech in Cyprus. So we mentioned also education. So it's, uh, I think, one key, uh, one solution, you know, we have to work uh, and, and educate, you know, uh, people. Yes. Thank you both very much. Uh, you have been listening, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, Meeting Points. I would like to thank Osger Kojadar and Julia Lev Dilmach for your time. 
it's time to wrap up and make sure everyone get the report uh, from the Friedrich Herbert Stiftung website. Link in the description. From me, Oresis Tringidis, thank you and good night.